Well, as we settle into our final session, I want to thank uh, uh, one more of our sponsors who helped us in the creation of this year's summit. We are grateful for the support of Farm Credit Services of America. Thank you. Uh, the agricultural industry is, oh, before I get going, there is a key fob out on the registration desk unless somebody picked it up and had Beck motors on it. There was a key fob at the registration desk. I think it's still there, right, Danny? Was there? I don't know. But there was a key fob, so uh, out there at the desk. Um, the agricultural industry is constantly evolving to provide new opportunities for producers. This next panel will highlight a few such innovative companies and detail what they bring to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. We will have departments Ben Stout helping us navigate our way through this panel. Our moderator of the panel is Ben Stout. He is the agriculture, ag development representative for the southeastern portion of the state. Ben grew up on a ranch south of Kadoka. After graduating from high school, he attended South Dakota State University where he earned his Bachelor of Science in Parks and Recreation Management and an MS in Communication Studies and Journalism. Uh, we have a last minute change to our panelists. Mark Lukey is joining us today from Pra Prairie Aquatech. Mark is the Managing Director and CEO of Prairie Aquatech. Mark was raised on a small farm in South Dakota, graduated with honors from the University of South Dakota School of Business, earned his certified CPA while advising his clients at global accounting and consulting firm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Jerry Palmer is the currently founder of Ovis LLC and Chief Compliance Officer at SAB Biotherapeutics. Jerry received his Master of Science degree in vet Veterinary Microbiology Sciences from North Dakota State University and his Bachelor of Science degree in Biology Microbiology from South Dakota State University. Uh, we also have another change. Uh, Dr. Patrick Zimmerman, who is the founder of CLOC, was supposed to be here, but he, like Lynn Churchman, got hung up on a plane in Chicago. Uh, so his daughter, Melissa, just drove in from Rapid City. So it, it, she said, I'm not sure what's on the PowerPoint, but she will make it through, she said. But I said, we will bear with you, Melissa. But uh, before founding CLOC uh, Incorporated, Dr. Zimmerman was a professor and director of the Institute of Atmospheric Science at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. Dr. Zimmerman received his PhD in rangeland systems ecology from Colorado uh, State University. Please help me in welcoming, welcoming our panelists and I'll turn it over to Ben. Okay, I think we'll get started with the PowerPoint, I guess. Okay, uh, Mark. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Uh, last panel. So here we go. I'm the much uh, less attractive form of Dennis Harstead, so thanks for Thanks for bearing with me. Uh, I'm going to grab the. And apologies that this doesn't necessarily fit the uh, the projector here, but I, you'll get the point here in just a minute. So, one of the things that we tried to draw an analogy to, because you don't you don't hear a lot about fish farming in South Dakota. Uh, we hear a lot about uh, farming cattle, farming hogs, uh, but there's not a lot of farming fish in South Dakota. So, one of the things that we draw an analogy to is. You know what was happening to our country and our dependence on foreign oil here just a few years ago, and you can see that our net imports on the green line are, are trending up. You know, into the mid um, mid 2000s there, and when U.S. agriculture stepped in, when our farmers stepped in and said, "Hey, we have a solution to this problem. Uh, we can use corn to produce ethanol," you can see what happened to our net imports. They dramatically uh, reduced, and so. You know, this is one of many, many examples uh, where you see U.S. agriculture stepping in and solving uh, a problem that our country has. Well, we have new global challenges that, uh, that our country is facing, and, and you can see several statistics uh, on the chart here. One that I found particularly interesting is that uh, as a global society, we raise more fish than we do beef. And, and that was astounding to me. But you can see it here in terms of metric tons, 66 metric tons of, of fish are produced uh, or farmed, and 63 million metric tons of beef are farmed. So that has implications. And you can see this is not from wild captured fish. It's not from going out in the ocean and capturing fish. It's actually from the farming of fish in tanks or in, in raceways or ponds or flow through systems. And so 
wild caught fish has flatlined, but aquaculture or fish farming is on a dramatic trajectory, and you can see that. But it hasn't really taken off in the US. Uh, and you can see in the upper right hand corner here, aquaculture is the second highest US trade deficit that we have in the natural resources category. And I'll give you one guess what the first is. It's, it's crude oil, which is why we started ethanol. And so this is a, it's a big problem. And because we have a low base that we're starting from, aquaculture is the fastest growing segment in both US and global agriculture. So it's, it's important. And, and you can see when you have something that's growing as rapidly as fish production is, you can about imagine what, what that's having uh, as an impact on commodity prices. So in the blue lines here, you can see uh, the price of fish meal, uh, which is the gold standard ingredient for aquaculture diets. Uh, fish meal is simply small pelagic fish like herring, anchovies, menhaden, uh, that are chopped up and you separate the oil from the, from the biomass and the biomass is protein. And that's what's fed to larger fish to grow fish. So you can see the volatility and the increase in the price of fish meal over the last decade. And it's, it's reached upwards of $2,400 a ton. Well, soybean meal, on the other hand, you, know, you can see hasn't had that same volatility. And soybean meal reached a high of maybe $550 uh, per ton. You'll, you'll probably remember that here just a few years ago. Uh, but on average, you know, soybean meal is in the $350 to $400 a ton. So you ask the question, where's the opportunity for US agriculture to solve this problem? When feed is 70% of the cost of production of aquaculture. So just imagine that. Where are we going to move the needle? It, it's in feed, and it's moving our agriculture commodities into the aquaculture diet. So this is, this is where Prairie Aquatech is focused. How do we create a product out of soybean meal that has a composition and performance that's similar to fish meal so that we can take advantage of this delta right here, the difference between the red lines and the blue lines? So one of the things that we have to ask ourselves, is this just a blip on the radar screen or is this something that's sustainable? Uh, and Rabobank, which is one of the largest ag lenders in the world, uh, they said, listen, the price line for fish meal will continue to increase into the future. And they look at alternatives, and there's a lot of things that you hear about as alternatives to fish meal, other plant meals or insect meals, uh, but each one of them have their share of challenges. So what Rabobank, uh, and they follow these, these commodity markets very closely, what they suggest the solution is, is we have to find a better way to use fish meal, and we have to have the application of novel ingredients like Prairie Aquatech is focused on. So again, in, in typical fashion, uh, our, uni our, our university systems, our schools like Lake Area Tech, uh, in this case, South Dakota State University, they respond to a challenge like this. This is where our research dollars go. And two professors, uh, one that uh, I'm sure many of you know very, very well, Bill Gibbons, uh, who's a microbiologist at South Dakota State, and his counterpart in fish nutrition, Mike Brown, they, sit, they were sitting on the back of a pickup truck out pheasant hunting, and, and Mike Brown was lamenting the fact that we can't include soybean meal at higher levels of inclusion in aquaculture diets. And Bill asked him why not, and one of the reasons is that there are anti-nutritional factors in soybean meal that keep it from high levels of inclusion in fish diets or in young animal diets. And Bill Gibbons, of course, said, well, I have a, I have a bug that'll solve that problem. And, and so they got together and, and uh, they, we patented uh, the solution that they came up with. And so what we're doing is we're taking soybean meal that you can uh, buy from South Dakota soybean processors or anybody else that's taking oil out of the meal. We buy that and then we aerobically ferment that. It's a sterile aerobic fermentation where our organism is taking the sugars that are bad for animals and it's converting it into cellular protein. And that elimination of sugars increases the soy protein and it also adds um, cellular protein. So now, instead of a 46% protein that has anti-nutritional factors in it, you have a 70% protein product that has no anti-nutritional factors in it. So again, getting something that has the composition and performance of fish meal was the target, and that's what we have. And so our product, Microbial Enhanced Protein, is then used as a protein ingredient in feed formulations. So aquaculture feed formulations are pelleted, 
And so we put lipids and vitamins and minerals with the protein source, and that's what's fed for enhanced fish health and nutrition. So we would use that as the basis to form uh, the company Prairie Aquatech. And at our core, we're an aquaculture technology development company. And so we look at the things that are important to grow an aquaculture uh, industry uh, in South Dakota, in the Midwest, uh, here in the United States, so that we're not importing uh, our seafood into the country. So, and we're also a partner in the production and sale of high quality ingredients. And so we'll talk about these two facets of the business. As a technology development company, we have a world-class uh, technology platform in microbial enhanced protein. So not only are we looking at soybean meal, but we're looking at things like canola meal. Canola meal has things called glucosinolates, and glucosinolates are also anti-nutritional factors for animals. So if you can remove those and increase the protein level of canola meal, that's also gonna improve animal health and nutrition and give our commodities a higher value market. We have a world-class development platform, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, but the people and the partnerships and the infrastructure necessary to create value-added products out of agriculture. We have a very robust product development pipeline, and uh, the team that we've assembled is really seen as a trusted advisor to the, the global aquaculture market. So people are looking to us to vet technologies prior to introducing them on farm. This is a, a picture of our team. Um, we have uh, a number of people that have in excess of 20, 25 plus years in the aquaculture industry. And you say, right here in South Dakota? <laughs> yes, right here in South Dakota. We've been very fortunate with, uh, in addition to the Governor's Office of Economic Development, we have a number of people that have uh, put both public and private resources to work. So we've put uh, over $20 million uh, into the, the product development and the infrastructure to support our product development. And uh, probably the most important thing that we've gotten out of this, in addition to the financial resources, is just uh, very uh, scientifically oriented people and uh, people that understand technology very well. They've looked at our technology and they've vetted it and they've said, you guys are really onto something here. That's been important to us. If you haven't had a chance to visit us in Brookings, I'd encourage you to do so. We have a 30,000 square foot uh, commercial demonstration uh, facility there. And inside that facility, we have a biological processing unit where we're doing the fermentation. We have a number of different size fermentation uh, reactors. We also have a small feed mill on site so that we can immediately compound our product into formulated feeds that can be tested and then we have a quarter million to 300,000 fish on site, all the way up from an on-site hatchery uh, to uh, uh, fish that are ready to be harvested uh, for, for feeding at a local restaurant. Uh, we're testing any of a number of, of different species like uh, salmon or trout or sea bass, uh, species that are important for U.S. consumption. On the partnership side, uh, we've just formed a partnership with South Dakota Soybean Processors uh, who have been a partner with us for uh, a number of years, but we formed a, a new company called Prairie Aquatech Manufacturing. And what Prairie Aquatech Manufacturing is responsible for is utilizing the assets of the technology company and building a 30,000 ton uh, commercial scale facility for this product. So we're bringing technology and management services. South Dakota Soybean Processors, where we're co-locating this facility, is providing land, infrastructure, and other types of management services to help reduce our risk. These are two gentlemen that uh, joined our team here uh, two years ago. These are uh, aquaculture experts in their own right, and, and you can read about their background, uh, but most importantly, they have over 50 years combined uh, experience in uh, deploying new aquaculture technologies around the world. So they have a very broad network, and it, these were skill sets that we needed here in South Dakota to be able to deploy an ag-based product into the global aquaculture market. Just a de quick depiction of, of the product itself. Again, we're starting with uh, soybean meal from South Dakota Soybean Processors in Volga. Uh, we reach 70% protein. In an aquaculture feed formulation, when the pellets are very, very small, uh, it's very important to pack as much protein as you possibly can into that pellet. It's very palatable, so the fish enjoy eating it, which is the, the first test that you have to get past as a, as a new ingredient. It's also very digestible. And, and this is probably one of the most important points that we found is that when you're digesting the phosphorus that's part of your, your feed ingredient, you're not 
allowing the animal to discharge it into the environment. So one of the things that we found was that uh, trout producers in Idaho that sit in this uh, Snake River Valley, the water flows in from the Snake River into a flow through system where the fish are raised and then it flows out. And whatever the fish don't digest ends up downstream. And the Environmental Protection Agency enjoys sitting downstream taking phosphorus discharge measurements and saying you can no longer increase the size of your operation. You have to decrease the number of fish that you're raising because there's too much phosphorus ending up downstream. Well, when you introduce a product that's 100% digestible, when 100% of the phosphorus is digested, it doesn't end up downstream. And so that allows the producer to grow the number of fish that they're raising. One of our customers uh, out of our commercial demonstration scale plant uh, is the largest trout producer for, for Whole Foods Market. And this is one of the things that, uh, uh, or some of the results that they experienced after uh, just two months of a six month feeding trial. And they stopped the trial short and they said, listen, we have to convert our entire operation to your product and your feeds because we, we can't continue to operate our business and not realize the benefits of your product across our entire system. So you can see an increase in feed efficiency, a decrease in fish meal use, uh, an in, a decrease in visceral fat, meaning that the filet yields was higher and they're getting a higher uh, price in the marketplace, and a 60% decrease in phosphorus discharge. So healthier fish, uh, healthier uh, operation. If you extrapolate that into uh, the global trout feed market, there's a million and a half tons of trout feed produced globally. And then if you further extrapolate that into the salmonid market, which includes trout and Atlantic salmon, there's 4.2 million tons of salmon feed globally. So if you think about this small little plant that we're starting in South Dakota at 30,000 tons, we're a, a small drop in the bucket and, and we've got a lot of growth opportunity. 40 million tons of aquaculture feed globally. And then when you put that in context of all animal feed globally, aquaculture is still 4% of a billion tons of animal feed produced globally. So there's a lot of opportunity. We have a, a number of other trials started in weaned pigs and dairy calves, uh, companion animals, and a developing partnership in the, in the human food market. Dennis Harstead, um, a uh, native of South Dakota is responsible for uh, constructing the plant. Dennis has started up a number of the ethanol plants located here in South Dakota uh, and even turned around some that are outside of South Dakota. Just a quick snapshot of the process itself. We take soybean meal, it's pre-treated, and then it's fermented, separated and dried, and it produces the high protein ingredient and a, a syrup stream. And we're currently exploring the use of the syrup stream as a growth medium for algae. So the location of the plant, again, Highway 14, uh, if you're familiar, uh, going uh, between Brookings and Volga, South Dakota soybean processors, uh, current facility. Uh, Prairie Aquatech has an option on the land just south of the facility. And if, again, if you haven't been to our, our pilot scale facility in uh, Brookings, look forward to having you there and uh, look forward to any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we'll get the slideshow switched. Um, I just would like to say these are three of the most innovative, um, exciting, interesting businesses in South Dakota. So looking forward to hearing uh, from Jerry and SAB. Thank you, Ben. Um, yesterday when I uh, was being interviewed by public uh, radio, um, they asked me the question on how this technology was going to benefit uh, agriculture and I thought about it and I said well this isn't really uh, benefiting agriculture but it's uh, uh, maybe the how these animals were created could uh, help create uh, unique animals in the future and I wish I would have sometimes when you do these interviews you always wish after you think about things you wish you could have re-answered that question and how I would answered it differently is that I feel that this uh, technology that we have is very important to agriculture because where it's going to benefit the most is you, the people out there, your loved ones. Uh, what I'm gonna talk to you about today is the technology that we have to help uh, combat uh, infectious diseases and possibly even cancer in the future. As always, I screw things up. Um, 
livestock has been a big part of human civilization. Uh, 11,000 years ago is the first documentation of the first uh, livestock animal that was actually um, tamed and domesticated by man. And that was a, uh, a sheep that still resides in Asia and part of Europe. Uh, this sheep, as you can see up in the right-hand corner, is a lot different than that sheep that is down in the uh, uh, bottom part. And this is all by uh, how man began to look for specific things that they liked and began to uh, start breeding for those traits. And uh, that's kind of uh, you know, the long, -term, t long uh, way of getting there. But it was started back in the 1700s when man really, or when uh, uh, humans began to realize that if you uh, had this animal breed with this one, you started getting certain traits. And that's when really when controlled breeding had uh, began to start and you started to get your uh, specific breeds. But it was the 20th century that uh, really started making uh, egg animals uh, a lot more productive by some of the artificial uh, reproductive technologies that we have, and namely artificial insemination, embryo transfers, embryo splitting. These all became a big part of uh, you know, taking uh, high dollared animals or valuable animals and expounding upon them. Um, it was in the 21st century, of course, uh, toward the, the, the end of the 20th century, that some of the newer technologies have come into play, uh, namely recombinant DNA and also cloning. And these two uh, are kind of a marriage that kind of helps where you can take uh, genes from a specific animal and insert them into another animal, say a Jersey gene into a Holstein gene for more butter fat, or you can actually take a gene and go from a cow into a pig so that you can make pigs make more milk for better gains on their litters. And uh, it also has allowed us to, uh, you know, uh, even take what we call human DNA and put it into animals so that we can get certain uh, proteins that may be therapeutic treatments for uh, human beings. And that's what my topic is going to be about today. This is one of our uh, uh, milestone calves that we were able to achieve that with. Uh, 468, uh, I mean, and there's a history behind how we got to 468, and I'm going to kind of explain that in this presentation. But that was the first animal that we were able to totally knock out the bovine ability to make bovine antibody and make pure human antibody in the cow. The levels were low, but it was a milestone. And through uh, our genetic modification of the bovine, we were able to increase these to where now it is going to be uh, a profitable business, will be a future, it hopefully it'll be a profitable business. It's kind of difficult to see, uh, I'll just kind of point it right there when you got the lights on, but there's a little red dot there. And that is what we call, it's, a, it's an artificial chromosome. It's, uh, it's pieces of human DNA that was pieced together that is able to communi communicate with the bovine cell in order to make this human uh, antibodies. Okay, touchy. Um, the use of animals in medicine uh, goes way, way back. In 1600s, there was a physician to Louis XIV that tried to uh, they knew that blood had some uh, benefits for, uh, for health, and so they took this lamb, and of course uh, it's tied down, and then of course they transferred the blood from the lamb into this human, this 15-year-old boy. Um, this boy felt a great heat along the arm, and I'm sure it was probably not much uh, soon after that, he probably went into shock and died because of what we call incompatibility. The, uh, the, the lamb bl blood that was going into the uh, young boy was seen as a, uh, uh, it was a foreign uh, substance coming into him, so the body reacted, and I'm sure within hours he went into shock and eventually died. There are human, uh, there are some animal uh, uh, polyclonal antibodies that are currently being used out there. 
Um, I'm not going to get in too much detail. Most of the therapeutics that you see advertised on, uh, on, on TV now are monoclonal antibodies, and they're made with a whole different type of uh, technology. But um, this, uh, polyclonals have been used for years for uh, treatment of rabies. Uh, uh, in the horse, there is, um, there is some snake venoms that there's a sheep product out there that they've uh, made in sheep. And of course, uh, for if anybody has had transplants, they're probably taking a rabbit polyclonal to suppress the T cells in your body from, uh, from you rejecting the organ that you possibly had during transplant. Um, so there are animal products that are out there, but the problem is that the body sees it as foreign. And I'm going to just give you a, a, a quick immunology lesson here. This is what an antibody kind of looks like right here. Um, this is considered a heavy chain. And this heavy chain, whatever species that comes from, like the cow, there is a lot of bovine proteins on here that if we were to take this antibody and give it to a human being, they'd see it as foreign, and they'd get rid of it as soon as they can. Um, same way with uh, a, a human has uh, uh, its own proteins on this the, here that it can recognize as self. So if you were to take human antibodies from us in this room and give it to a patient, they would more than likely accept that. If you were to take that and put it into a bovine, the bovine would see it as foreign, it would reject it. So in order to get the human antibody um, uh, into the animal, we had to go in and knock out the, uh, bo the bovine's ability to make a uh, bovine antibody. I'm going to talk about uh, that little red dot I showed you. This is a human artificial chromosome. This has certain pieces of uh, DNA taken from a cell culture, from a human cell line. And these are pieces here are what make the human antibody. Um, this was developed over in Japan many years ago. They tried it in yeast. They tried it in cell culture. It didn't work. They finally put it into a mouse and saw that there was some, some uh, promise of it being in an animal. And that's because of the complexity of the immune system. So uh, 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 there was a gentleman by the name of Jim Robel that had cloning technology. These people from Japan had the hack. And they got together and they decided, OK, let's try to make this cow that can make human antibodies. This has been about a 20-year process that we've been involved in doing this. It's been a long, long um, road. But we, uh, we've got there. Now, in order to knock out the bovine immune system, it takes uh, what you have to go in into these cells, and you have to find the, the, the specific uh, piece of DNA that is going to make the bovine antibodies, and you have to go in there and put some type of stop code on there so that it will not make it. The thing we found out with bro bovine is they have three different areas that they can make antibodies in. So we had to go through a series of cloning, breeding strategy, and finally, uh, you know, um, we, we thought we had it kind of conquered, and then, uh, again, then we realized that we found this other spot. So we had to go in there, and by the time we were done with this particular uh, whole project, it was about 14 years to get this to where we were finally able to completely have a knockout animal that we could have a chromosome in, in which the cow was making human antibodies. These are some of our TC cattle right here. Uh, so they have this chromosome, they've been, they have this knockout, so they're not making bovine, and they produce fully human immuno, uh, gamulaglobulin, which is what we call human IgG. And uh, when we first started with these, these cows were making like 0.2%, and then we got a little higher to 2 grams. Right now, these cows are making anywhere between 5 and 20 grams, where a normal cow will make about eight, 17 to 18. So on average, we have about 10 uh, uh, grams of plasma that we can obtain from these animals. So we have our TC bovine. The next thing we want to do is immunize it with whatever uh, 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 antigens we have of interest. And then once we have a hyperimmune animal, we go in and do plasma collection. 
uh, jumps over to purification. Then we take that plasma and we go through a purification pro uh, 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 process, and then we have the antibiotic therapeutic that is ready to go into human subjects or drug testing, as we call it. This is one of our animals, 2317. She produces about 17 grams per liter. So these, we, we usually start vaccinating these cattle when they're about anywhere from nine months to about a year of age. That's when the immune system seems to be full, fully functional. So they go through a physical, they have to meet a certain weight, certain age, they have to go through specific disease testing in order for us to qualify that animal to be vaccinated. Then they will immunize this animal with whatever antigen of interest that it, we have, and I'm gonna go through a list so I won't talk about it right now, with a particular adjuvant that gives, uh, 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 slowly releases this antigen so that we get a good antibody response in these animals. We test the titers to make sure that we are getting a response. We use that by mainly in vitro testing, test tube, test tube testing as you would, or testing at the lab benches, what I, what I would probably call it. But sometimes we have to do a mouse assay in order to uh, get titers. Sorry about this, it keeps coming up. So this is the plasma phoresis machines that we use. They are, they are hu uh, human plasma phoresis machines. We had to go in and reprogram them because they were set up for humans, so we had to have a special program made. But what happens here is you, you hook a, a tube up into the vein of the cow, and then there's one return. Uh, the blood goes through this. It's kind of like a centrifugation procedure where it centrifuges out the red blood cells and the white blood cells. It, center, it, it pulls off the plasma, which goes into a little bag, down, or a, uh, a one liter bag down here. And then this machine will uh, kick in and return, put some saline back into the, uh, into the red blood cells, and then this will be pumped back into the cow. So the cow is getting all the red blood cells uh, uh, returned and the white blood cells returned back uh, to her. So this allows us to then go back in and we can plasma freeze these animals like three times a month. This is a picture of our purification procedure, our uh, facility. Um, it's a very sterile environment. Um, we take that plasma in there and they will put it through a, uh, a chemical treatment. Uh, it's a precipitation where they'll precipitate out the proteins in the plasma. It goes through a column for uh, uh, pulling out a uh, um, uh, molecular weight type deal so, so the, the antibodies kind of stay back. It goes through a column then to peer, pull out any unwanted uh, uh, antibodies or proteins that we may have. And then it goes through a filtration device so it has sterile filter and it goes in uh, to these vials and it's ready to be distributed. Um, the purity on this, on, through this purification process is about 99.5% pure, total uh, pure human antibodies. This is a picture of it. This is an, uh, a product that we made for an Ebola study. Everybody kind of has heard about Ebola. This is uh, currently in, in testing right now. So just to give you an idea what a cow can make, if we have a 1,200 pound cow, she can produce about 30 liters of plasma a month. That's about 600 grams of IgG. From that 600 grams of IgG, we're able to make about, uh, produce about 1,500 vials of, uh, of this product. So one vial we usually say will treat, uh, it depends on the disease and what you're treating, but one vial will treat approximately about uh, one patient. So you can imagine from one cow in one month, you can treat possibly roughly about 1,500 patients. So the product development pathway. We have what we call a preclinical development, which uh, is uh, where our research and development is in de developing this cow, these cattle uh, and the vaccinating of them. Then we have to go into tests where uh, we do safety and efficacy to show that this product is going to work. This is done in vitro studies and in animal uh, studies, uh, rabbits, uh, mice, guinea pigs, uh, monkeys. We then take that data and we put it in an IND filing and go to the FDA. And we asked the FDA if we can start putting this into human beings. This is called phase one, phase two, phase three. This is called clinical development. Uh, the first phase of most studies is, is you'll take your product and you'll put it into, into about uh, 30 
healthy individuals just to make sure that you don't have any side effects from the product that, you're develop that you have. We just completed one, fa uh, one of our phases in this study, and uh, right now it's still blinded, but uh, as far as we can see, it's very encouraging. Then you would, once you take that, you go to the FDA and you present the data here, and they will let you go into sick individuals, sick patients that are suffering from the disease for treatment. They will, you'll go through that phase, and then you'll go in, you'll present this to the FDA, and then they'll go into what we call phase three, and this is the, this is kind of the final phase that then you can submit this data, and they will give you a licensure to produce a pharmaceutical product. This is about a three to five year uh, period to get, uh, get through this. We also call this the valley of death because it takes a tremendous amount of money to get through this, pr pr this clinical uh, study. Um, they say that uh, to take a, get a drug to market, it's gonna take anywhere between 400 million and close to a billion dollars to get a pharmaceutical product um, on the market. That scares away a lot of investors. Um, the other thing is, is one out of 23 pharmaceutical products will ever get to a licensure. So it's very costly. Um, there's a lot of challenges ahead, but um, in this particular uh, photo is where we're currently at. We're working with a product that is a influenza. Um, we are currently in this, doing the safety and efficacy studies. C. difficile, we've just began to get in that. Um, this is mers cov not to be uh, in, uh, confused with the, 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 the MRSA. This is actually a viral disease. It's over in Saudi Arabia. Um, the camel, it spreads from camels to humans. 40% of the people that end up in the hospital usually do not make it. Uh, very deadly. So uh, the Saudis want us to make this product. We went through phase one in healthy individuals. The product looks really good. And we are just getting ready to go over to Saudi Arabia to start a phase two study. So that's just kind of a quick rundown of 20 years of research. And I'll be glad to entertain any questions uh, after our last presenter. Thank you. Okay, and last but certainly not least, uh, Melissa Zimmerman from Sealock in Rapid City. Uh, we will have some time for questions afterwards, so uh, hold your questions for after, please. All right, Dr. Zimmerman um, really apologizes for not being able to make it. He was um, very excited and honored that he was invited today um, to show you what Sealock is all about. Sealock is a small family-owned, family-run company. So I'm Dr. Zimmerman's daughter. My older brother, Scott, does all our um, data and analytic work. And Tom, my little brother, runs our shop where we build our products. So um, my job at Sealock, I am um, director of human resources. But um, my full-time job, I am a school administrator. And I think um, managing a group of engineers is more challenging sometimes than managing a kindergarten room. So <laughs> we at Sealock um, employ a lot of engineers that graduate from the School of Mines in Rapid City where we are located. We also have um, several interns that attend the School of Mines too. So um, we're glad to keep it local and Rapid City. So we have several products at Sealock. We're a high-tech company that is dedicated to bringing the latest technologies to farmers and ranchers. Um, we have two goals. One is to save farmers and ranchers money, which who doesn't want to save money? And the other goal is to um, help you reduce your environmental footprint. Um, Sealock started with green feed. That is our first product, and green feed measures, um, measures methane, um, CO2, O2, hydrogen, and hydrogen sulfate from a cow's emissions. Um, why you'd want to measure that, we'll get into that in a second. Here we have an, one of our newer products. It's called Smart Feed, and it allows you to precisely monitor animal intake. 
So we also have Smart Feed Pro, which allows you to monitor animal intake and um, precisely deliver supplements to certain animals um, that you may have. So a cow erectates once every 90 seconds, and, um, or belches, which you guys might be more familiar with that term. So it emits um, CO2 and methane once every 90 seconds from its mouth, not from the opposite end as people might think. So um, its emissions are a sign of animal health and feed quality, pasture quality, those um, sorts of things. So why you would need to measure uh, CO2 and CH4, it can show you um, genetics, uh, animal health, such as mastitis, lameness, ketosis, and um, it also helps you determine your pasture quality and your, the quality of the supplements that you might be giving your cows. We have um, one of our green feed units in a Lely milking robot at Michigan State University, and we were able to see that um, the cow was sick 36 hours before they actually had to call it from the herd. So if they could have identified that, then they would have been able to save that cow, thus saving you money. Um, traditional ways to measure methane are in chambers. So you have to put an animal into a box, and that's how they measure methane. Our cyst green feed system can be dropped off in the pasture, and so the animal is in its um, regular environment, and there's not stress, so you get a better picture of its actual emissions. Uh, here's another way to measure it. Um, another one using a fistula or just a head chamber. Uh, Dr. Zimmerman invented the first way to measure methane from a cow using um, the SF6 tracer, so it would swallow a, a trace gas, and then um, when it belched, its uh, emissions were collected in that tube around its neck. You would need a gas chromatograph to figure out um, exactly its emissions. So he wanted to invent an upgrade of this system, one that was easy for anybody to use, and that is green feed. So how does it work? A um, cow approaches the feeder, so they're just going to be getting a small amount of food, like a little treat. The idea is just to have a place where the cow will hold still for like 90 seconds. So as it's eating, air is being pulled over its mouth and nose, and then um, passed through our system of sensors. All that information is stored on board, or you can have it delivered via cell phone modem or Wi-Fi. So you can check on your cows. Um, you could check on them right now with your cell phone and, and see um, the data. It's measured once per second. So green feed is reliable and easy to use. It's low maintenance. Um, you can measure for a longer period of time, and it's low impact on the animal behavior. It also has an intuitive online interface. Another advantage is all the data that you get from GreenFeed is your data. We also um, use it for um, papers and uh, animal research. GreenFeed can be a Customized for tie stalls, free stalls, pastures. We have one in a milking robot, like I said. And um, any, pretty much any type of customization that you would like. Currently, we have over 100 green feed systems all over the world. So on every continent except for Africa and Antarctica. And Africa has gotten several quotes from us. They, they would like to have a green feed system. The blue dots are our new... Um, machine called Smart Feed and Smart Feed Pro. We currently have a hundred Smart Feeds out, um, mainly in research facilities, but we're projected to have a thousand by the end of the year. So here are some of our clients where our Green Feed and Smart Feed machines are um, all over the world. 
green feed has over um, 100 units in 20 countries and 30 peer-reviewed papers, that kind of information if you're interested. Uh, that stuff, I'm skipping over. <laughs> So green feed can, um, depending on where you put your green feed, you can have about 20 animals, 20 to 25 animals. Um, one place tried uh, 55, which was probably too many in a dairy. There's a picture of green feed in a tie stall, in a free stall, and in a milking robot. There's a beef trial. And then we also have green feeds for other small ruminants like goats and sheep. There's a green feed just out in the pasture. As you can see, it's ran um, by solar power. It actually takes um, less energy to run a green feed um, compared to a light bulb. So why would you want to monitor um, and control intake? That is what our smart feed system does. Smart feed um, allows you to control and monitor intake. It gives you an idea of genetic and uh, feed efficiency, RFI, and allows you to formulate and tailor feed to individual animals. And allows you to control medications and what supplements your cows are getting. So here is a picture of smart feed and it measures individual feed intake. So a, a cow wears an RFID tag, and when it comes up, Smart Feed reads that tag and then automatically will measure how much the cow is eating. All that information is sent directly to your cell phone automatically. Um, there's another picture of Smart Feed. Smart Feed. Um, there are kind of the options and things that SmartFeed can do for you. As you can see, SmartFeed is portable and um, other things on the market that are similar, you have to have a number of them because they all work together or you have to have a platform built for those machines to be. This one can be just dropped off in a pasture. Or you can have um, one or you can have 20. And, um, Put it wherever you need it to go. Smart Feed Pro is, um, allows you to pro specifically program what cow you want to eat and you can even program what time you want that cow to eat and how much. So if you only want certain cows to get a supplement or mineral or even a medication that you're um, giving, then you can program Smart Feed to do that. So when the cow approaches, it will um, deliver the certain amount of mineral and then it shuts it off the cow after they've had that certain amount. Then if another cow comes up and you have not um, programmed that cow to come, it won't allow that cow to eat. So you um, can precisely monitor what cows are getting and um, when they're getting. So you can also, um, fit smart feed with a webcam and you can check on your cows. My husband has a ranch down in Wall. We live in Rapid City and so he can check on his cows from um, Rapid City down in Wall. Here are some options. A smart feed is available in a trailer unit. You can get one, two, or up to four smart feeds in a trailer unit that is um, you just pull it out in your pasture and drop it off, and it's ran by solar power. In the future, um, we are in development of a SmartFeed Pro, um, Super SmartFeed Pro, which will um, allow a creep system and allow a huge amount of supplement. So you could go a couple months, depending on how many cows you're feeding before you have to fill it again. Uh, we also are developing a portable hand-carried sniffer for um, farmers and ranchers so they can um, hold it up to a cow and it will analyze its emissions and signal a vet if it's sick. Um, we're also developing an automatic 
disp um, dispensation of vaccines and like a uh, fly spray. So when a cow approaches a feeder, it will give it a vaccine automatically if, if it needs that. Um, I guess that's it. And so I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. If I can't answer questions, I'll certainly write them down and um, have Dr. Zimmerman get back to you as soon as he can. See, Bob's got the microphone out there. Does anyone in the audience have questions? Question for uh, the, the aquaculture feed gentleman. Uh, one of your supplier you, you're providing feed for is a whole food supplier. Are they asking for a GMO-free uh, product? They are. Yep. And just a um, we're agnostic. Um, you know, it uh, our pro our process works with uh, conventional soybean meal or non genetically modified soybean meal. We're here in South Dakota. We're very fortunate that South Dakota soybean processors, uh, through the acquisition of the of the Expeller plant in St. Lawrence, uh, South Dakota, uh, they're contracting with farmers to uh, to produce uh, non GM beans and organic beans, and that really differentiates us across the U.S. because it's not, that's not an easy commodity to come by. And that allows our process then to take the, the non-GM meal all the way through the process. And, and yes, Whole Foods is very, very interested in that. I'm just uh, asking about smart feed. Is there a way you can put uh, scale, attach scale to that so you can weigh your animals when they come feed? Yes, I believe they're um, developing that, uh, so it does have an, a scale attached to it. Other questions? I do have one um, for everyone, I guess. So you guys have really groundbreaking technology. Um, obviously, you have roots in South Dakota, but you're also great business, business people. Why did you choose South Dakota to, to get started with your, your business? Well, Ben, you, I, you, you named it right off. I mean, there's no better business climate, um, especially for uh, an ag tech startup. Um, you know, again, we're, we're the benefactors of uh, the Dakota Seeds program that the Governor's Office of Economic Development has. We're benefactors of the Proof of Concept program. So for an ag tech business looking to get started, there just there isn't a better state, I can promise you. Uh, and we, we travel around the country and, and we, you know, we know a number of the different programs that are available. Uh, second, and probably closer to our business model is, you know, we, we want to be closest to the source of feedstock uh, in our business, so closest to the source of soybean meal. Uh, we happen to have the cheapest soybean meal in the country uh, here in South Dakota and the source of non-genetically modified, which doesn't exist uh, elsewhere or very few places. Uh, so that that's also very very important to us. Uh, you you saw the uh, or we talked we were talking about China in the economics discussion here uh, before. You know China's the largest processor of soybeans, and so they're buying more soybeans uh, around the world from North America and South America than any other uh, place in the world. They process over 60 percent of the soybeans globally. Uh, so we're sending our soybeans to them. Uh, when you send soybeans via container, you're sending a lot of sugar. You're sending a lot of air. You're sending a lot of water uh, in addition to the protein. And they turn around, they grow fish, and then we import all the fish back into the United States. It doesn't make any sense. So you know, what our business is doing is you know, trying to reduce the transportation costs uh, on, a, on a per unit of protein basis. Uh, and if we're able to grow an aquaculture industry here in South Dakota, all the better, uh, because then we can keep everything, all the high value products, uh, as close to home as possible. So um, that's you know, a couple, couple reasons. Um, SAB was actually uh, started in Kansas City, and they were getting their oocytes for cloning out of Yankton, and they um, were using Transova genetics just across the border for uh, their embryo transfers. Um, they looked at Sioux City, Iowa, Sioux Center, Iowa, and Omaha as possible uh, places to set up. Um, I went to the people at Forward Sioux Falls and I said, get on them. And uh, they did. And I know that they've never regretted moving to Sioux Falls or to South Dakota. 
and they won't leave. So, so uh, Dr. Zimmerman uh, per, er, previously worked for the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, which is where I grew up. Um, then he took a job through the School of Mines, uh, and then he invented a way to um, uh, do carbon accounting, and he um, sold that invention and started Sealock. Um, in Rapid City, and I, I don't think that there's anywhere else that he would rather be because of the opportunities that South Dakota has to explore um, his hobbies like hunting and fishing, and, and as well as um, we have access to some of the best engineers in the world, I believe, through the School of Mines. So. Any other questions? If not, uh, let's give our panelists one more round of applause and we'll turn it back over to Craig. Well, that concludes uh, 2017 uh, South Dakota Agricultural, Governor's Agricultural Summit. Just a reminder, next year, mark your calendars, July 11th and 12th in Rapid City. So again, thank you for all attending. Thank you for the sponsors. And again, congratulations to LTI for their award and uh, have a safe trip home. That concludes the summit. Thank you.